It was a crisp, sunny day in February 2003. Spence Havlick stepped into a train car at Union Station in downtown Denver. I remember the color of the train. It was kind of a maroon with yellow painting. And it was beautifully appointed. He was one of a few dozen local politicians and other VIPs on this train. They sipped coffee and ate rolls. Havlick, though, he was preoccupied with the view. This car had huge windows. We could look out that window as the train ran along, and the vistas were remarkable. The scenery, you could, you could see Denver fading in the distance. They would have seen a hidden side of Denver and its suburbs. If you live here, like I have for the last seven years, you're used to seeing the same things from the highway. Stadiums, downtown office towers, the occasional mountain view. But on the train, Spence Havlick would have seen backyards, industrial areas, and freight rail yards. Spots that were hidden away from the traveling public since passenger rail service to Boulder went away more than 60 years before. After about 25 or 30 minutes, the train crested a hill. Havlick's own city of Boulder spread out like a postcard below. And then as you look out the windows to the west, you could see the Continental Divide. And it was almost like a fairy tale. And people were very excited about it. I must say it was euphoric. Havlick says it was like a spiritual experience, like being high above treeline in Rocky Mountain National Park. They descended smoothly into Boulder. Havlick had made that trip countless times, but usually he was stuck in traffic in a car or a bus. But this, this time was different. You did not feel the vibration. You did not hear the noise. Just that subtle clickety-click, clickety-click of the track. Havlick and his fellow passengers were full of hopes and dreams. They stepped off the train in a grungy part of East Boulder. Havlick had organized this trip to convince his colleagues that rail service could transform the city and shape its growth. It's like the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. The proof of the efficacy of this train was in the riding of it. And stepping off into a essentially underdeveloped area, unused area, with great potential. He wanted to see new homes and businesses here, maybe even a high-rise or two. The train would allow people to live in Boulder and easily and comfortably commute to Denver and vice versa. Soon after this ride, Denver area voters showed that they also believed in Spence's vision. In 2004, they passed a ballot measure to raise their own taxes, raising billions of dollars for new rail lines across the entire region, including here in Boulder. That was 18 years ago. Last November, I met up with Spence. He's a slight, white-haired, retired academic, and we went out to that same spot where he got off the train in Boulder. The dusty warehouses, they're long gone. It looks completely different now. There's a beautiful plaza surrounded by new homes and even a restaurant. It's a pleasant 68 or 70 degrees and people are enjoying a brew and a burger. But the rest of the plaza is empty. There are benches, there are chairs, there are bike racks, but it's empty. And I don't see people. I don't see people milling around. Because of the work of Spence Havlick and many, many other people we'll hear from in this story, Boulder built this station. And Denver's transit agency, the Regional Transportation District, or RTD, it built most of the train lines that it promised. But not this one. This train never arrived. People here are still waiting, and they're pissed. 
New at 10, it's the commuter rail line that may be finished in time for your grandkids to use. RTD now says without getting any extra funding, that train that voters agreed to pay for in 2004 will not be fully operational until the year 2050. I don't think anybody would make this deal today, but it's, it, that doesn't matter. The voters have been paying taxes for this project now since 2005. And so it's just a question of how it can be expeditiously delivered. The story of Denver's love affair with trains is one of shared dreams and unstoppable personalities. Billions of dollars in gleaming new infrastructure for a city on the rise. And for one particular corner of the metro area, it's a story of disappointment and betrayal. From member-supported Colorado Public Radio, this is Ghost Train. How one polluted, traffic choke city went all in on trains. And what happened when that plan jumped the track? I'm Nathaniel Miner. Since I started covering transportation for Colorado Public Radio in 2019, I've learned as much as I can about this non existent train. I want to understand the anger over it. It is so intense and pervasive. But I wanted to make this podcast because I think this story is about much, much more than one failed government project. Because Denver's not the only city opening new rail lines. Los Angeles, Austin, Seattle, cities all across America are turning to rail to face down big things like climate change, traffic, and inequity. But it's really hard to overlay a rail system on cities built for cars. Some projects go wildly over budget. Some never happen at all. Others open, but then aren't used very much because they're in the wrong place. Denver's faced every single one of these problems. The city's transit agency has opened new rail lines at a crazy fast pace. Half a dozen new ones in the last eight years. But are they useful? Are trains really the best way to challenge a car-centered culture? What if there were faster, cheaper ways to move people? And also, whatever happened with that Boulder train? To answer these questions, I'll look at Denver as a case study. Why the city started thinking about rail, how it put rail into action, where it succeeded, who it failed, and what it might do next. Because all of this says a lot about the future of Denver, Boulder, and so many American cities. So in this episode, to understand the future, we first have to go back. Way back. Denver's relationship with railroads is nearly as old as the city itself. It was a dusty settlement of only about 5,000 people for its first decade. Then, a rail line to Cheyenne, Wyoming opened in 1870, and the city boomed. Its population grew by tens of thousands, and it became the leading city in the Mountain West. Most people walked or used streetcars and trolleys to get around Denver and every other American city during this era. But that started to change because cars became more popular. By the 1950s, Denver streetcar tracks were ripped out. The federal government subsidized thousands of miles of new interstate highways across the nation. And our congested cities will also get relief with freeways and express highways to speed you to work or to route you around the cities when you're crossing the country for business or pleasure. If you live in the city, it means you'll be able to live 30 miles or more from the job and still get to work in half an hour. You'll be able to live where you want, work where you want. All those new roads and new cars pushed development outward into shiny new suburbs. Those green backyards and white picket fences, they came at a cost, though. Traffic and air pollution. Morning in Denver, and when the smog isn't too heavy, Denver has rather beautiful mornings. But often the smog is heavy because, among its other distinctions, Denver has more automobiles per capita than any other city in the country, including Los Angeles. A Denver rush hour. The state legislature tried to do something to address these air quality and traffic issues. It created a new public transportation agency 
the Regional Transportation District, or RTD for short. It covered the entire Denver region, and even rural places in the Rocky Mountain foothills. And to start, it only operated buses, but it always had bigger ideas. And some of them were pretty far out there, like a network of elevated tracks that would carry pods around at 40 miles an hour. Personal rapid transit, it's called. It would look something like this. These pods are wild. They look like a big piece of 1970s Tupperware sliding down a rail track. They were supposed to be the best of both cars and transit. You could go where you want, anytime you want, and skip traffic too. Denver's plan is to have 800 such vehicles operating 24 hours a day. When completed in 1983, there will be almost 100 miles of track or guideway in the city with 58 transit stations. This Jetson's fantasy? It never came to pass. And every other rail plan RTD came up with during the 70s and 80s, they failed too. Meanwhile, the air quality problem did not go away. By the early 80s, it had a name, the brown cloud. It was full of little particles in the air, many of them coming from diesel emissions. Invisible carbon monoxide was a huge problem too. The combination of these things posed some serious health risks. The city tried to fix it. It asked people to drive less, to take the bus in winter months when the problem was at its worst. But by 1988, the city's air quality had become a national punchline. That year, the Denver Broncos lost their second Super Bowl in a row. For a town that's never been number one in anything but carbon monoxide levels, the Broncos' second Super Bowl loss in a row was doubly depressing. That quip from a CBS reporter hit a nerve. The Denver Post called it a slur and printed it on the front page. The Chamber of Commerce offered to buy the reporter a one-way flight out of town. Two days later, the reporter filed a follow-up story. He recites a tongue-in-cheek list of many of Denver's proud achievements, like the world's biggest laundromat at the time. And other firsts we didn't know, Denver claims the first ice cream soda. And in 1935, the cheeseburger was invented here. There's a little monument to it. Yes, Denver had the cheeseburger and a giant laundromat, but it was more than a little insecure. Denver's gone from the cow chip to the computer chip, and we really haven't let our self-confidence catch up to that. A brown cloud of smog hovering overhead, streets clogged with cars, and a second-place football team. Denver was worried the rest of the country thought of it as a dirty, backward cow town. But Denver was determined to live up to its vision of itself as a sleek, modern, first-class city, worthy of the world's attention and investment. That vision started with trains. After more than 20 years of planning and failing to build trains in the Denver area, RTD's fortunes finally turned by the early 1990s. It scraped together enough money to build and open the city's first light rail line. It was short, and these weren't Jetson pods, but these shiny white train cars they drew big crowds when they opened in 1994. Thousands of people have come out to check out Denver's light rail. It's almost like being at Disney World, checking out the newest attraction with people waiting more than an hour to catch Denver's newest ride. It's the greatest thing that ever happened since the horse and buggy days. It is? Oh, yeah. Well, why do you say that? Absolutely. Well, it's the uh, most economical transportation you can have. The line snaked through downtown Denver to a park and ride outside of downtown. And it was only a few miles long, mostly a novelty. The mayor, though, Wellington Webb, he saw its potential. So I'm very excited. I think this is just another piece in the puzzle for our long-term growth and economic development for the city and the whole metro area, because it ties us all together. Passenger trains were back in Denver for the first time since the 1950s. The city was keeping up with its competition, like Portland and Seattle, that also had light rail. And it was pulling ahead of others that weren't. Excitement was high. But Denver was still a car town. And even RTD's governing board was split over light rail. Some wanted to keep building more. Others said it was too expensive. It was unclear in this moment if RTD was going to pursue its rail dreams. 
So the stakes were high when that board hired a new leader in 1995, Cal Marcella. I loved Cal. You know, he was so optimistic. Cal put out an energy that lifted everybody up. I was uh, always very cynical about Cal Marcella. I just did not see Cal Marcella as an honest person. I think Cal's vision was to build the best rail system in the country. This whole story you're going to hear over the next few episodes, it may not have happened without Cal Marcella. He would end up overseeing one of the largest public works projects in Colorado's history. But back when he was hired in 1995, Cal did what nearly every transit rider in the Denver area did. He rode a bus, sometimes with his employees. Yeah, we started riding the bus and other people from from work. I mean, people rode the bus in and we would sit and talk about, you know, transit and RTD. And he was he was just unstoppable. He lived it, he breathed it, and he he believed in it and he motivated people. That's Marla Lean, who worked with Cal as a lawyer at RTD for more than 20 years. Marla and Cal were something of a yin and yang. Cal sported a white mustache and beard. He sort of looks like he'd play Santa in a Hallmark movie. He died in 2016. But Marla remembers him as an energetic leader, always making big plans for RTD. Marla is a slight woman with long, straight brown hair. Um, we're getting a lot of background noise right now. Is there any way you could... Uh... Not unmold my cake. <laughs> yeah. What is it that you're doing? I'm unmolding a cake. Oh, you're molding a cake. Whose birthday is it? Unmolding a cake. It was in the pan. I had taken it out of the oven before, and I want to get it out of the pan. Uh, All right. Okay. When she was at RTD, she was the skeptic. It was her job to figure out what could go wrong with Cal's plans. Barry said that your nickname was the Princess of Darkness. You were always bringing people back to Earth. (laughs) Like I said, I was a skeptic. (laughs) That nickname was in good fun. Cal and Marla clicked. They were both from the East Coast, where transit is more second nature. Marla says when she got to Denver, the way people saw transit was different. You know, when I grew up as a kid in the New York area, I'd say there were commuter buses from the corner and people would get on in their dress shoes and women would get on in their fur coats in the winter and go into Manhattan by bus to work. If you worked in Manhattan, that was not unusual. Colorado, people didn't use buses. It was seen as something for people that couldn't afford cars or couldn't afford two cars. And rail was perceived very differently. Cal observed the same thing. While he was interviewing with the board, he didn't really say whether he supported rail or not, and that helped him get hired. But after he was hired, that changed quickly. Here he is in an archival interview. I really think what happens with rail is that it's perceived to be a superior commute alternative. It's certain in terms of schedule. It's reliable. It's safe. um, You can predict your time travel every day. And I think people really like that. If car-loving Denverites wouldn't get on buses to help improve traffic, then RTD was ready to give them more trains. RTD had an extension for the stubby first line already in the works, and they were thinking much bigger. So in the mid-1990s, RTD put together a plan, a plan for about 100 miles of rail lines and new bus lines stretching out of downtown Denver into the suburbs. And RTD was serious about this plan, Cal didn't want it to sit on a shelf, as so many other plans had done in the past. His organization had new credibility after opening the first light rail line. And Cal, he was going to put that to the test. He convinced his board to send the plan to the 1997 ballot, so voters could decide whether they would cough up billions of dollars to pay for it. And that is where RTD's opponents pounced. They attacked the plan's high cost. They said it was squishy, that it didn't say exactly what was going to be built. Those attacks worked. RTD lost, and badly. It was a huge disappointment for RTD. But Marla Lean says Cal wasn't ready to concede defeat. We lost that election. He was just going to go back and do it again, because he was going to get it done. 
So RTD doubled down. It cobbled together enough money to open two new light rail extensions by 2002. Cal said later that those helped RTD get its mojo back. We had built our first few rail lines and they were so successful that the agenda in Metro Denver ceased to be, will it work? And it became, when do we get ours? Everybody wanted a line. And Cal wanted to deliver on that desire and build on this momentum. So RTD put together another big plan to take to voters, a plan even more ambitious than the failed 97 one. They called it Fast Tracks. This plan would dramatically change Denver's transit landscape and parts of the city itself. But only if Cal and RTD could get the votes. That is coming up next. Hey, it's Nate. I want to take a moment to tell you about another podcast I think you'll love. Purplish is a show about Colorado politics, hosted by some friends and colleagues of mine in the CPR newsroom. Each episode gives you an inside look at what's going on at the Colorado State Capitol. Andy Kenny and Benta Berklin are veteran public affairs reporters who explain the big ideas and the personalities making news at the legislature. Follow Purplish from Colorado Public Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Cal Marcella needed to get support for Fast Tracks, his new plan to build more than 100 miles of passenger rail across the Denver metro. And he set out to do that at just the right moment. Because Denver had a newly elected mayor, John Hickenlooper. He's a household name in Colorado politics now a tall, lanky transplant from Pennsylvania who loves to use cowboy phrases in conversation, like giddy up. He served two terms as governor and holds a seat in the U.S. Senate. But in those days, he had just wrapped up his career as a brew pub owner and was getting his feet wet in City Hall. In those days, the suburbs hated the city of Denver. The city of Denver hated the suburbs. There was always feuding. Denver became the economic hub and had all the tax base and the, the economic muscle, and yet the suburbs felt that Denver lorded it over them and punished them and, and said, listen, this is the way it's going to be. Hickenlooper was a Denver guy. He lived downtown, but he did not like this dynamic, this back and forth fighting. So right away, he tried to change it. That Saturday night after my inauguration, we threw a party for all the mayors and their spouses and all the county commissioners and their spouses from the whole metro area in lower downtown, but, you know, a five-story building. And I had big windows looking out over the skyline. And we had, I don't know, 120 people there, all kind of fired up. And I gave a three-minute speech just saying the days of Denver making decisions based on their own self-interest and that alone are over. From now on, if we can't make a decision that benefits a neighboring suburb as well as it does ourselves, if we can't find that consensus, we'll go work on something else. We will not make decisions that, that put you at a disadvantage. And we will not poach your businesses. We will we'll do everything together. And there's a long pause. And then people stamping their feet, cheering, shouting. I mean, there was an appetite that I don't think anyone really had recognized that this was pent-up energy, it was potential energy waiting to be unleashed. Hickenlooper became a key ally for RTD's Fast Tracks plan and for Cal. As he later told me, he says it was like my birthday and Christmas all rolled into one. I mean, I was all in. It was an opportunity for me to walk my talk about being collaborative. And when I campaigned, I told Denver citizens left and right that I didn't think Denver could ever be a truly great city without great suburbs. Cal used that collaborative spirit to his advantage. He went out to those suburbs and towns to make his pitch. His peers say his energy could light up a room as he convinced business leaders, community groups, and local city councils that this train network, it was the answer to their problems. He would come to our city council meetings and say, this is something that Bowler can really take advantage of. Remember Spence Havlick? He rode that special train to Boulder I told you about earlier. Well, he was on the Boulder City Council back then and was a big supporter of rail. Other community leaders, though, they wanted faster bus service instead. Cal was a salesman, though, who could paper over conflicts like this. 
He told the council his fast tracks plan would do both bus and rail. Yeah, I mean, it looked like a win win. <laughs> I mean, he was very persuasive. Did you have any doubts then that he was over promising? Some people said that he's a good salesperson and that uh, he may not be able to deliver on all of these promises. But for the most part, I was persuaded that he was sincere and that he would deliver. Cal was selling this as hard as he could, but it was a huge, complex plan. It would be the largest transit project in the country. And he had to face tough questions from critics and from the press about whether RTD could actually keep its promises. Can you guarantee, uh, Cal, that Fast Tracks will be completed on time and on budget? I feel very comfortable in, in committing to that, and I feel very confident that we'll be able to meet or beat both the cost estimates and the schedule that is in the plan. Even Marla Lean, Cal's skeptical lieutenant, she says the plan was solid. Independent organizations also vetted it and agreed. But not everyone was convinced. RTD could only raise a limited amount of money through its ballot measure. Other transportation officials in the state thought Cal was overpromising. And some people within RTD, they told me they were concerned too. But those concerns weren't enough to keep the plan from going to voters. RTD got fast tracks onto the 2004 ballot. And that's when the campaigning truly began. A shoestring opposition tried to derail Cal's plans. A libertarian group called the Independence Institute led the charge. They hired an anti-transit advocate named Randall O'Toole from rural Oregon. Randall, just tell me about your background. How did you end up in this line of work? Well, it's a funny thing. I spent 20 years studying the Forest Service for environmental groups and focused on forest planning and managed to persuade the Forest Service to reduce timber sales by about 80%. Having won essentially all those battles after 20 years, I began looking around for other government plans to examine. Randall often wears an Old West string tie. Not a bolo tie, but imagine an old-timey saloon keeper tie. It's like a bow tie with long ribbons hanging down. Anyway, he's made a career of analyzing and criticizing public transit, which is funny because he also professes his love for trains. But as we talked, it all started to make sense. I don't know if you can see, but there's a picture of a passenger train behind me. I collect railroad stuff. I've traveled on Amtrak hundreds of thousands of miles, but I also recognize that I'm weird. And I don't think other people should have to subsidize my hobby. And that's what Randall claimed that fast tracks would be. An expensive system that people really didn't need and really wouldn't use. He says in sprawling cities like Denver, it's cars that offer people the most freedom in life, including where they live and where they work. We have excellent data showing that you can reach 10 times as many jobs within a 20 minute drive on, in, in your car, then you can reach within a 20 minute transit ride. These are the types of things Randall would bring up during the campaign. He was paid to debate fast track supporters at events all over town, at rotary clubs and senior centers and in front of business leaders. He argued that fast tracks was too expensive, that Cal and RTD were overestimating how many people would ride the trains and how much that would loosen up traffic. So over and over again, they said things that weren't true. Some of them might have been things that they believed were true, but others were things that they knew weren't true when they said them. And they said them anyway, especially if they knew that somebody like me wasn't around to keep them honest. I just did not see Cal Marcella as an honest person because in all of our debates, he frequently said things that simply were not true. But Cal said that RTD's plan appealed to that freedom and access. His trains weren't going to limit anyone's ability to drive. They were simply going to be an alternative. 
people have the car. It's just, and cars are wonderful. They're just not good for every trip. If we can get people to drive a mile or two to a park and ride, take the train in, leave their car at home, we solved the problem. I drive my car a mile and a half to a park and ride, and I'm off the highway before I create a problem. It's a great model, and it works. As The Onion famously wrote, 98% of American commuters want other people to ride transit so they can drive in uncongested traffic. Randall knew a lot about Cal's plan was exciting to Denver voters. The promise of skipping traffic and the ability to keep driving if they wanted to. RTD said they were just giving people more choice, more freedom. Randall and his side struggled to get their points across. The Independence Institute had to pull some publicity stunts to get on TV. The pro-transit side, they could buy their way. If you vote yes on 4A and the Fast Tracks plan, it could change the way you start your day and open a new door to the city. John Hickenlooper was in these commercials. He still had a full head of brown hair back then, and he appeared looking longingly out the window of a light rail train. So why stay stuck in the past when you can move smoothly into the future? Fast Tracks, the time is now. Finally, it was November, Election Day 2004. Cal Marcella, Marla Lean, John Hickenlooper, and other Fast Track supporters gathered in downtown Denver at Union Station. And that was a symbolic choice, because this big, cavernous, empty station was going to become the hub for most of these new train lines. But back then, it was in really tough shape. The interior was plain, with empty benches. It was not a place to gather, especially after dark. Vacant lots bordered it on the outside. There was just one like bar restaurant in there in those days that was open late, and we were all down in there. The Fast Tracks team huddled at the one open bar inside, the Rocks nightclub. Blue and white balloons floated up above the dozens of people jammed inside. Proponents of Fast Tracks are ready to get moving. We're up 5644. The early returns were looking good for RTD, really good. A campaign manager told Marlene that it was over. They were gonna win. And they're like, all right, you got it. We're winning. We're going to win this. I was like, how do you, you know, I, I mean, a really small percentage of the vote was in. Marla was skeptical at first. She was the princess of darkness after all. But as more results came in, they looked better and better. The antsy crowd started to party. Drinks were flowing. People were hugging. Fast Tracks won by a huge margin. It was exuberant. I mean, it was, we had worked so hard. It's been so long. It was, um, it was real celebration. It's one of the, I mean, it was really an amazing night. Mayor John Hickenlooper, a very happy mayor tonight, along with a number of other mayors that are present at this gathering, watching referendum 4A pass overwhelmingly. Fast tracks will be built in the next... Mostly I just felt a sense of elation. So many people coming up and patting me on the back. Cal Marcella gave an interview to TV News that night from Union Station, and he barely cracked a smile. He ran through his talking points, but this man looked like he was ready to get to work. So the whole program is built out in 12 years, but there'll be incremental lines open as we move along. It's funny, when you pass something like that, it's such a long project and such a massive undertaking that that the excitement isn't as exuberant as you win, when you win a Super Bowl, right? Because the work is just starting. Because the work is just starting, right? You realize, look how far we've come. We've got a plan. We've got funding. But look how far we have to go. <laughs> we all said, oh, now we got what we asked for. We were just kind of joking about it. The next morning, Marla Lean and her colleagues went back to work. We were all still in a really good mood. I don't think we really understood just how hard it was going to be because RTD had a long way to go before it could break ground and start laying track for these trains. And do you remember all those predictions that RTD was overpromising? Well, those turned out to be true. The cost overrun, if you will, or the driving up of the original price, to me wasn't surprising. The question was whether the whole thing was going to collapse, really. Next time on Ghost Train, how RTD straggled to the finish line and what Denverites learned when they tried to get on board. Hey, 
It's Nate. If you're enjoying Ghost Train, I have a quick favor to ask. Take a moment to find Ghost Train on whatever podcast app you use and give us a like, a rating, or a review. If you think the stories we're sharing are important, if you think reporting about accountability matters, all you have to do to spread the word is like us, rate us, or review us. It really does help other people find this podcast. Thanks for listening, and thanks for supporting podcasts from Colorado Public Radio.